Well, a warm welcome to this talk and uh, a particularly warm welcome back to Professor Robert Clancy all the way from Sydney. Professor, welcome back and thank you for coming. My great pleasure, John, as always. Now, uh, Robert Clancy is well known to the, the channel. He's a consultant physician, a professor of immunology and holds qualifications in medicine, science and pathology and is a holder of the Australia Medal. So great, to, great to have him back. Now, you've been doing quite a lot of work recently, Robert, on uh, long COVID. And I think we should say that one of the big advantages of being, shall we say, at our stages in uh, later stages in our careers is you don't have to worry about publication so much. So quite a lot of what we're going to talk about now is, is fairly original work. So thank you for sharing that with us. So we want to talk about um, post-vaccine and, and post-infection long COVID. Um, now, both of these syndromes you, you've been seeing, you've been seeing patients with these. Can you just tell us roughly, roughly, roughly what you see? Patients with long COVID, patients with long COVID vaccine injury. What, what, are, you, what are you seeing? Well, I think the first point, uh, John, is that uh, there's no great mystery to, to these conditions. Uh, w what happened was with the infection, uh, initially people were seeing ongoing symptoms and came up with a diagnosis that was vague and confusing, and it was called long COVID. Now, long COVID was anybody who had symptoms following COVID infection that persisted for more than three months. And the confusion for this is that it, it included a number of different problems and every patient had a different mix of these problems. And so uh, for people who uh, were working outside of, say, immunology and related, uh, related disciplines, it, it was incredibly difficult. But to simplify it, there, there are basically two different components. Uh, it's been known really since the late 1800s, that people who get particular infections uh, have a chance of getting a persistent fatigue illness that follows it. And that's quite, it's nothing different about COVID. And so the essential component of long COVID is what is essentially post-viral infection fatigue. And it has two central components. The first is what I call energy activated fatigue, which means that if you do something, uh, then you pay for it, you get more fatigue. And the way I discuss that with patients is I talk about a ceiling. I say, we've all got a ceiling. And uh, in people with post-viral fatigue syndrome, long COVID, that ceiling comes down. And if you try to push yourself with energy, then you hit that ceiling, that ceiling pays you back and you suffer for hours or days with uh, increased fatigue uh, and um, associated characteristics. The, the, second characteristic, the second feature of this uh, chronic inflammatory state is cognitive defects. And most people don't say, oh, I've got a cognitive defect. They say, I've got brain fog. And uh, it comes in many different forms. I always have, I had a, I worked at McMaster University in Canada for some years and set up the immunology department there. And I, I remember I had this wonderful patient uh, who was always late for appointments. And um, I once said, why is it that you're always late? You know, I'm seeing you at the end of the clinic when you're actually supposed to be here two hours ago. She said, well, it's, it's part of my, my problem. I stand at the bus stop. And I see the bus coming along and it says McMaster University. And by the time it's sort of registered, the bus is gone and I've got to wait for the next one. And so there are all sorts of variations. I had other patients who were maths teachers who had to give up because they, they couldn't sit and look at the board and do simple mathematics. So brain fog is a terribly, uh, a terribly incapacitating problem. But when we came to long COVID, uh, patients had these symptoms, but they had other sets of symptoms, which were more structural damage. And so while in classic chronic fatigue illnesses, you don't have so much in the way of structural damage to tissues, the brain, the heart, in long COVID, you did. And that's because uh, if you look at the underpinning cause of all of these, it's the antigen is persistent. Uh, in classic chronic fatigue, it's Commonly, not always, but commonly, the Epstar-Barr virus, which is the virus in my country we call glandular fever, 
uh, I'm not sure what you call it in, in England. Is it glandular fever yeah, or yeah. infection? Yeah. Well, the Americans but, might but, yeah, we, we would say glandular fever, or if you're feeling a bit more correct, infectious mononucleosis. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of confusion, though, but there, there's no question that a number of patients will have that incarcerated into their cells, and under various stresses, uh, the virus escapes, and you get uh, fatigue, illness, maybe a sore throat, big lymph nodes, uh, things like that. And so we, we've known a lot about that, but along came um, long COVID, and the patients had damage to their peripheral nerves, often uh, small fibre neuropathy with burning feet, burning legs, uh, major problems in the brain, uh, cardiac issues, a whole range of structural abnormalities. And they got all thrown in together. And you can understand the, the confusion of people saying, well, how do I sort this out? You know, there's no obvious treatment. Um, what's going on here? Uh, and that's the way. I know. It's interesting, I, knowing that we were going to talk today, I, I just printed out uh, the latest paper that I found on cause of um, long COVID, uh, which came out just last month. And um, it's a very interesting paper because it's full of detail, but not full of message. A and it's a whole list of different things that people see without saying, well, wait a second, what's the big picture here? What's really going on? And, and unless you approach it in that way, you can't really help the patient because the patient wants to understand what's going on and wants to have some logic in terms of what they can do about it. Uh, and I, I think that's where an immunologist basically looks after these patients. I mean, people with chronic fatigue illness have usually fallen into the basket of clinical immunology because um, most people who work in vertical systems like chest or heart or lung or brain um, look at a particular disease in that system whereas immunologists look at a mechanism across the different systems. And so we try to understand a process that's going on in a, a person with autoimmune disease, chronic fatigue illness, various conditions like that, and then address the diagnosis uh, in that form, uh, look at tests that might help understand that process and medications or processes that can help uh, the patient with those issues. So I think that's the broad sort of difference that underpins this. Now, so that was chronic, that was chronic fatigue in the context of, um, of uh, the COVID infection. And then more recently, people are saying, wait a second, I'm seeing people uh, who have had vaccination who have never had uh, uh, COVID. And these people are developing very similar symptoms. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, I see, in, I don't see a lot of patients these days, but I certainly see uh, a number. And I, I have a number of patients who have uh, had vaccines, never had COVID, um, but they've got essentially long COVID syndromes. And again, it's a mixture of classic um, energy activated fatigue, brain fog, together with certain structural problems. Uh, so, and the reason that it's very similar is that the persistent antigen is the same antigen. It's spike protein. So you're getting spike protein from the infection, COVID, and that can persist at least 12 months, maybe a lot longer in some of these patients. Whereas uh, with vaccine, we know that the spike protein, the messenger RNA vaccine that is given, uh, disseminates through the body. Uh, it provides expression of the spike protein on potentially any cell in the body, and that can go on for months or year, at least a year. And remember, the, these are new syndromes. We, we didn't know about them until the last couple of years, so we don't know how long these conditions go. But the bottom line is that there's the same cause for the post-vaccine long COVID, if you like, and the post-infection long COVID. And this is incredibly important to understand. And sadly, it is not understood very widely because if you go and have, oh, I've got a patient at the moment who had uh, post-vaccine uh, long COVID and then got COVID infection. And of course, um, people said, whoa, dear me, all those terrible symptoms you've got of long COVID, they've got worse. Um, we thought if you'd had a vaccine, you'd get um, much less problem with, with, with COVID. But of course, uh, it's a totally different situation when you're looking at a small proportion of people who get post-vaccine long COVID to the average person who might get 
uh, a vaccine which reduces the intensity of COVID and therefore is linked to a degree of less chance of getting severe long COVID disease. And so there's this commonality of persistent antigen that underpins both those conditions. And we need to understand that if we're going to uh, apply effective management strategies. It's, it's, it's really quite hard to understand this. So when someone's vaccinated, if they get this long vaccine COVID situation, instead of producing the antigen for a few hours, they're producing the antigen chronically over o- over a year or, or more. Um, what, 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 is, what is happening there? How, how can the vaccine, which is a single dose, go on and produce spike protein for, for a year or more? Well, I think that's, that's the big question, isn't it? And the answer is fairly straightforward, that if you have a messenger RNA vaccine, that messenger RNA, we know, um, in the way in which it's packaged and presented, will go throughout the body and can uh, be taken up into essentially any cell in the body. Now, when it does that, it, the messenger RNA uh, expresses through the ribosomal system in the cell, the factory for proteins. It, it, it expresses spike protein, which is represented on the surface of the cell and can be detected in blood uh, for uh, a length of time. Now, when it's expressed on the uh, length of, um, uh, on, on the cell surface, uh, in most people, it, it's probably only a relatively short period of time, but in some people, in fact, a significant number of people, they'll express it for a long period of time and they get an immune response. Because that, remember, that's what you're trying to do with messenger mm. RNA vaccine. You're trying to stimulate an immune response. But what uh, was not understood and, and sadly had not been properly tested right at the beginning uh, was that this antigen Um, can persist for a long period of time and be the focus of a self-destructive immune response, very similar to autoimmune disease. And that's exactly what's causing one of the two main causes of the structural damage I'm talking about. Remember I I said you get a, a chronic inflammatory situation due to the persistence of the antigen and an ineffective immune response that's not clearing it, which leads to low-level inflammation, which leads to the exercise-induced fatigue and the brain fog. But now you can also express this antigen uh, as a foreign antigen on the cell surface, and that's destroyed by T lymphocytes, as that's the job of the T lymphocyte. It doesn't know that it's not supposed to do that because it's someone's injected messenger RNA into you. Uh, and so you get structural damage. Uh, one of the commonest ones I see are people with um, small fibre neuropathy, um, which is terribly disconcerting. Uh, burning uh, feet, uh, disbalance, um, neurological issues, flare-up of my- demyelinating diseases, uh, cardiac issues, uh, all of these structural damages, and they're different in every person, which makes understanding and analysing post-COVID, either post-COVID syndrome extremely complicated and extremely difficult. I mean, it's, it's probably getting into the pathophysiology a bit, but if you're going to go on produce, producing spike protein for a year after vaccine, do you think that means that the RNA has somehow gone into the DNA and there's an ongoing process of transcription here? I think there are probably two ways of answering that. Firstly, I don't think there's any doubt that you can reverse transcribe into DNA. That's been shown in human cells uh, at least... On, to my knowledge, on three occasions. Um, And and that is a worry in its own and quite different to the problems we're talking about here. Uh, That's looking at how it can change DNA expression in the individual. Uh, It it raises all the questions of um, um, progressive and expanded cancer. Uh, It looks at uh, transgenerational defects if it gets into the germline cells. Uh, So that's, that's a different issue. Here we're talking about messenger RNA without necessarily going to DNA, just working, doing what messenger RNA does, and that's code for the amino acid sequence in a protein on the ribosomal factory in the cell. And so you're making all this spike protein. You don't need the DNA for that. 
Uh, you've got the, the DNA normally makes messenger RNA, but we're actually giving messenger RNA. So we're, we're, we're adding to, to, to the pool. And so you've got all these cells making spike protein for God only knows how long. Uh, we don't know how long, a long time. And um, that's creating, uh, um, and one of the factors that conditions, a very important factor, because not everyone gets post-COVID, not everyone gets fatigue. Uh, it would seem that there is a subset of people who are more prone to develop um, persistent non-resolved antigen. In other words, the messenger RNA keeps producing antigen and the body's immune response doesn't effectively clear it. Um, if we had a lot of time, I could run through the, the, the background information for this. But let me just summarise and say, in my view, about 20% of people are fatigue prone. Uh, there's a phenotype. Um, you know, you look at kids who go to university and say, how many of you uh, have ever had fatigue at the time of exams and whatever? Bit of a sore throat. About 20% will say that. About 20% of athletes um, get uh, um, essentially overtraining syndrome, which is a, a form of chronic fatigue. It's the form that most people with chronic fatigue would love to have. It means they just drop their, their time for 100 yards by 0.1 of a second, but it gets yeah, yeah. them out of the final. Um, yeah. but, but it is a, a very good model system that we, we looked at very closely some years back. The, uh, so you, you've got this situation where there's a, a group of people who appear to be prone, uh, and they're the ones who will get post-vaccine fatigue, and probably the, the ones who have got the persistent formation of um, the spike protein and get um, long COVID with both the fatigue and the structural uh, defect problem using different mechanisms, totally different mechanisms for the two. So it sounds like we've got two mechanisms going on. Well, the, the main mechanism, whether it's long COVID or post-vaccine long COVID, is persistence of the spike protein. The spike protein is still produced for whatever reason whether it's long COVID or post-vaccine injury, chronically being produced. Sometimes the features are as, as a result of specific tissue damage because the T cells have beaten up these cells which are expressing the spike protein, wherever that is. And of course, we know that can be anywhere in the body now because the vaccine is systemically distributed. So we've got the tissue damage, but we've also got the ongoing inflammatory effects, the, the effects of the chronic inflammation that we're seeing as long COVID or long post-vaccine long COVID? That's, are they the two sort of main causes of the, the clinical features? Exactly. But uh, keep in mind, there is one underpinning common denominator, and that is persistent antigen production, which is a feature of all the chronic fatigue illnesses going back to influenza and all the other issues that, that we... Um, and this may, this is just my view, and may, I often turn out to be wrong, but it, it's my view is that there's a phenotypic um, uh, uh, proneness, if you like, to developing a fatigue illness when they're stressed with, and they're more likely for some reason to get a persistent antigen because they have uh, a less effective immune response than other people. So most chronic fatigue syndromes can be explained in terms of the ongoing persistence of some virus, presumably mostly a virus, causing these, these chronic features. So in theory, if you could like wave a magic wand and eradicate all the virus from the body, the patient would get better, apart from the pathology that's caused by the tissue damage, the, the irreversible tissue damage. No, that, that's absolutely right. And in fact, um, um, when we were dealing with the uh, Institute of Sport, in Australia with the elite swimmers, uh, you might remember they, they win gold medals, uh, but some of them didn't. And um, uh, we found that what was happening uh, at the time, the stress of international competition is in a number of these people start excreting Epstar-Barr virus in their throat. So normally it's contained by a wall of T cells. And under the stress in the people who have got a partial immune deficiency, so they've got a predisposition of not having a really effective immune response, when they're expressed, and people with long COVID will say the same, where under psychological or physical stress, um, I get worse. And um, we looked at this very carefully with the uh, elite swimmers, and we were able to uh, completely 
uh, obliterate that expression of Epstar-Barr virus coming out in a condition which used to be called overtraining syndrome by doing one of two things. Uh, the first is we, we actually treated them with highly potent antivirals and prevented this and maintained their swimming capacity. Uh, or we identified that the main precipitating factor was a particular type of physical stress, which was um, high, high energy training. And so we changed their training program. Uh, and the Olympics uh, in 2000, uh, every Australian elite swimmer swam to their predicted best, which had never been before. And it gave our physiology colleagues a very good jobs for the English Olympics, which came next because the English wanted to know why our swimmers were doing so well. Uh, and it partly was because they didn't get subjected to uh, fatigue-induced uh, impaired performance um, by changing their training program. So well, all of these issues um, come together with this persistence of, of antigen and control of that antigen. Uh, Epstar-Barr virus, as you know, gets integrated into the DNA of cells uh, and it should stay there. And the T cells are critical for that. Uh, with spike protein, uh, they should never, <laughs> it should never uh, be expressed systemically and should never um, have a persistence uh, of expression. But in some people, of course, it is, and they're the ones prone to developing these fatigue illnesses. So you're going to be getting inundated with emails from Olympic committees from around the world now, Robert, asking for your assistance. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, about that. <laughs> all that work's been published a couple of years back, and, and yeah. sadly, sadly, our competitors know about it. So, um, so this means that basically everyone has been exposed to Epstein Barr virus, just that some people manage to eliminate it and some people don't. Exactly, eighty uh, percent of people um, it, with the the athletes uh, was pretty much ninety five percent of the athletes uh, had been exposed, uh, had marker IgG antibody. And this is the interesting thing, that the, the people who um, have glandular, have the Epstar-Barr virus uh, and who are prone to getting fatigue never quite make the right sort of T-cell response. And I'll, I'll give you two quick examples, and these relate exactly to the situation in, uh, that I'm certainly seeing and uh, has recently been published to some extent uh, with long COVID. Um, if you look at antibody production... The antibodies are made by a cell given the very imaginative title of a, a B cell, a B lymphocyte. But the B lymphocyte requires T lymphocytes to help them. So we have these helper T cells. Now, it appears that there's a defect in the T helper cells in people with long COVID, and this has been identified in different studies, and certainly exactly the same in people with other chronic fatigue illnesses. And the way the T cell deficiency expresses itself is that the B cell has markers of not working as well as it should. Now, if you get a virus infection, you make what's called an IgM antibody. The IgM antibody is the first antibody, but it's not a particularly high affinity, good, effective antibody. And so what the body does, it replaces it with an Ig. G antibody. So you go from IgM to IgG. Now, uh, which is a much higher affinity antibody. And you make different subclasses of IgG. And there's four subclasses, IgG1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, two things uh, I noticed over the years, looking after literally hundreds of people with chronic fatigue illnesses, is that number one, Many of these patients never switch from the IgM to the IgG antibody. And so when you do a routine Epstar-Barr virus in antibody, and every doctor who, who's watching this will know, you look for IgM antibody because that tells you you've got a current infection. You've just got the infection. And suddenly, and I, I used to get a phone call every couple of weeks from general practitioners that I work with saying, hey, this is confusing. I've got a patient who's got IgM and IgG antibodies, and they've had them for weeks and months. And of course, these are the people who have got ongoing chronic fatigue, and they're not actually eliminating or controlling their Epstar-Barr virus by virtue of the fact they're not making a particularly effective 
immune response. And the response defect goes back to the T cell because it's not helping the B lymphocyte make a highly efficient, effective IgG response. And so when you do a routine test, the IgM, which should tell you it's a recent infection, but it's not. It's been there for weeks or years. And an IgG. And, and the second, and this is really interesting because only just a month or so ago, uh, this was found for long COVID, that in people with chronic fatigue syndrome, one of the things that uh, we noticed uh, in our clinic was that a number of these patients have IgG subclass deficiency, particularly an IgG2 subclass. And it didn't, initially it didn't make much sense. And I started seeing both the IgM, IgG confusion plus the IgG subclass deficiency, both of which depend on good T cells working. Um, now, different subclasses have different jobs. And so IgG2 has a particular job. And if it's very low, then you've got a defective antibody response by virtue of this. So what a, a wonderful study I saw, I, I, I think it was about a month ago, John, um, where they looked at IgG subclasses in long COVID. And lo and behold, there's a highly significant reduction across the long COVID, something that's never really been done for chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, the classics. Um, significantly lower IgG2. So exactly the same thing is occurring in long COVID, which brings all of these chronic fatigue illnesses uh, collectively uh, together. Mm -hmm. So moving on to the sort of um, management strategies that, that we're going to use, Robert, I mean, I mean the question is, of course, what, what the heck do we do, we do about this? So um, do we need to promote a more effective immunity within the respiratory tract and how would we do that well uh i don't have all the answers no one has all the answers but i i think that if you understand the process that's going on you can see some sense in going forward now i can run through there there are five things that that uh, i do with with, with my, my patients uh, or I, i'm thinking about uh, the first is that we we, we've developed the idea, and I, I've talked briefly uh, about this with you before, of what I call immune resilience. And that is, um, and I think in the context we discussed it before, I said, why is it that 99% of people who get long COVID uh, are, are inconvenienced for a few days, they feel a little sick, a fever, sore throat, and then they get better whether you treat them or not. But 1% or 2% get very sick, uh, and some may die. And yet you look at that collective group, and of course there are predisposing factors for getting very sick, but many of them are just like you and me, uh, that we all look the same, we think we're the same, and yet we handle the virus differently. And this has been an area that my group's been interested in for a long period of time. And um, we developed the idea that there's a, a thing called immune resilience, and that there are ways of shifting that immune resilience so that that 1% behaves like the 99%. Now, that, that's something that, that, that my own, you know, we've been certainly working on and uh, not available yet, but, but I, I think it, it is the way, one of the ways to go in the future. So in other words, people who uh, get uh, uh, airway infections uh, handle it more effectively and don't run into the complications, which obviously include long COVID because of a defective immune response. So I, I think that's uh, for the soon future, not, not a long term. Uh, the, the, the second is to understand the process as being persistent antigen. Uh, now, the spike protein um, is, I think, without question, the persistent antigen in both these cases. Uh, and this is a, a practical area. Uh, and there are two approaches currently uh, being used. Um, uh, our, our friends and colleagues in America uh, have developed various enzyme packages uh, based on nanokinase, which is a, a long stay, very interesting um, uh, orally uh, in, or an ingested enzyme that has specificity for spike protein. And I know studies are being done uh, in, uh, in America uh, using these um, substances. Uh, and we're really looking forward to seeing uh, how, how they come out. Uh, the second thing you can do about the expression of spike protein is blocking its effect. Um, Really, really exciting work has come out in the last few months about how ivermectin works. And there's a complete re-look now at ivermectin, uh, about time I may add, but um, 
And I, I think I think one of the things that's bridged from the the narrative that that was very unkind to uh, Ivermectin and the reality of science is the demonstration by uh, a combination French and American groups showing that Ivermectin blocks the uh, uh, blocks spike protein. So it blocks the spike protein getting into the cell and it blocks it aggregating red cells, which is the reason that you get low oxygen tension, uh, low oxygen saturation in patients who get significant COVID. Uh, and uh, I, I was on one of the three papers that, that showed that I mean, it was amazing. Within 24 hours of taking ivermectin, oxygen desaturation reversed. Now, that's not suppressing inflammation. Yeah. And now, by virtue of these studies, it's shown that uh, you disaggregate the cells and so the oxygen can return very quickly. Now, I've been treating some of my own patients with moderately high dose of ivermectin for a month. I think I've treated five or six, and every one of those has improved. Now, that doesn't mean a thing. It's not a randomised controlled trial. Uh, it, it's, it's what I call clinical medicine. You, you look uh, at, at, at a problem, you say this is a process, uh, what logically can be done. Now, it's not necessarily going to change all the structural damage that's been done, but certainly uh, there's been some improvement, not, not necessarily dramatic improvement, some improvement uh, in a month or so uh, of taking ivermectin. I, I think what really is needed is people who um, have access to um, academic uh, um, uh, academic uh, situations where they can study and do these uh, a randomised control of ivermectin in long COVID properly done uh, would be the most important thing that can happen uh, in, in long COVID. Um, the, the, the third thing that um, that I think is really, really interesting in long COVID is that, uh, and particularly a couple of Chinese groups have been promoting this, and that is that people who get long COVID get a disturbance of the microbiome in the bowel. Now, you might say, how on earth can that relate to something that's going on in the airway? Well, um, I was lucky enough years ago to work with John Bienenstock in Canada, uh, who came up with the idea of the common mucosal system, which is been underpinning my work over many years uh, in humans. And uh, it, it just suddenly I realised that all our focus on this common mucosal system was the immune expression, not the microbial drive. And when you think that the, the architecture of this common system that expresses control over all the different mucosal surfaces of the body, the architecture involves sensor systems all the way down the gut, not just the small bowel with pious patches, but all sorts of little patches with specialised M cells, they're called, over them that allows bacteria to come in. And so I, I think the important thing to understand here is that the commonality of mucosal immunology and expression involves the microbiomes at the different sites. And so uh, what happens uh, in the airway by swallowing and affecting post patches can distort the microbiome in the gut and the microbiome in the gut can equally influence what's going on in the airway. And I'll just give you one very exciting um, uh, observation. Uh, and that is a, a group was looking at, uh, in mice, they were looking at Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is a, a nasty bacteria that causes pneumonia. And they couldn't understand why on earth, when they gave pneumonia to the mouse by putting the, the bug in the airway, their microbiome changed. Uh, this is in the gut. And of course, um, the reason is this commonality, this communication system that's so effective. So what they found was, and, and this is exactly what was found in the patients with long COVID, a particular type of bacteria was depressed. And these bacteria, well, bacteria that produce short-chain fatty acids, butyric acid, um, acetic acid, propionic acid, those three main, one, two, and three um, carbon short-chain fatty acids. Um, now, the people in, working with the mice and Klebsiella said, well, what happens if we um, reduce these bacteria uh, in the gut, then the the main product from the bacteria uh, is things like butyric acid. And so they measured butyric acid and found it was very low. So very sensitive. They just started feeding butyric acid 
to these these mice, and their Klebsiella pneumoniae became much much uh, improved. Uh, didn't completely cure them, but it certainly improved, showing there was this connection between the two. So you have two ways in which the microbiome can change the expression of any form of chronic fatigue. One is by metabolic transfer of of uh, receptors of um, molecules that can move around through the blood seam, and secondly by changing the cell delivery systems through the aggregate and lymphoid tissue of pace patches, um, sequel patches, and the various ones in the colon. So that to me is very exciting. And I, again, if you can bear with me for 20 seconds, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very, very important example. Many years ago, Tom Barodi, who was the guy who discovered the, uh, the treatment for peptic ulcers, to, which eradicated them, uh, he also was the person who um, really developed the idea of fecal microbiome transplants by changing the microbiome, by washing you out and giving you some healthy ones. Um, Tom, Tom is uh, quite extraordinary. Um, he, Tom treated patients who came to him with fatigue and nonspecific gut symptoms and was surprised to find not only did the gut symptoms improve with this FMT, but so did the fatigue. Now, uh, no one quite believed it. So he went back 10 years later, 10 years later, and found something like 60% of the patients. And most of those patients still had a resolution of their symptoms, including their fatigue. Now, you don't see that in chronic fatigue illnesses. In other words, by having a specific intervention, there was some resetting of the system, which we don't understand very well. And so... Um, I, I'm, I, I do a clinic in, in, in Tom's practice, uh, and uh, he was my PhD student. And um, he, Tom, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually, if he's watching this or I'm going to send him an email, Tom, uh, you've got to go back and start looking at uh, how we can manipulate the microbiome and have outcomes in long COVID. Um, so... Um, I, th I think the, the, the next thing that I think is really important, so we're, they're the three things that I think are really important. The next thing is don't feed the syndrome. Don't keep giving people vaccines who have got long COVID syndrome because um, you look at the literature, and I, I just did a review for a journal uh, last week on a meta-analysis of all the studies done on vaccination and, uh, and long COVID. And it blew me away. I mean, it was a very well done study. And, and 20, there was a 20% reduction of long COVID in people who have been vaccinated. But I looked at the number of people, it was 1 million. If you're looking at probably 100,000 or a couple of 100,000 people, they get lost. In They're very different. They're the people who have got a fatigue illness, maybe phenotype, that have developed this in the context of the vaccine. And you give them more vaccine or they get COVID and they get worse. This is a concept that... I find nobody really, or, or most people, have great trouble grasping. Uh, I just noticed this morning while I was waiting to hear from you, John, that uh, Peter McCullough wrote one of his um, uh, reviews, and it was making exactly the same point. You know, you don't vaccinate people with chronic fatigue syndrome, you're just putting petrol on the fire. And, and of course, the, yeah. yeah, the final thing is you address the issues the person has. Um, uh, I, I noticed that some of my colleagues say a lot of these people have got in the morning, uh, you can't work, you lose your job, you're broke. Um, you're going to have a touch of reactive depression and anxiety. And um, it, it's not that they have a primary mental health problem. They've got serious responses, mental health responses of a normal type to a, uh, to a very uh, incapacitating problem. So that's, that's our approach anyway to, uh, to chronic fatigue illnesses. Excellent updates, and uh, we'll uh, certainly keep an eye on this one. But I, th I think it gives us real cause for, for hope here, Robert, that, that there is potential ways ahead for people that are suffering in this way. Yeah, but for now, thank you very much, as always. Thank you.